الرحيم الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على أنبياء الله جميعا وعلى خاتمهم حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين There are three important occasions in the history of Islam, the most important milestones in the history of Islam. The first is the beginning of the mission of Prophet Muhammad that started 40 years after his birth on the 27th of the month of Rajab when he received the very first five verses of the Holy Quran while he was meditating at the top of the mountain, Jabal al-Nur, Mount Light in Mecca. Those of you, many of you in the audience, you've been to that cave. The Prophet used to go for almost 10 years. When he was 30 years old, he would leave his family and he would go there and meditate and worship and reflect until one day Gabriel came to him with this message اقرأ باسم ربك الذي خلق خلق الإنسان من علق اقرأ وربك الأكرم الذي علم بالقلم علم الإنسان ما لم يعلم O Muhammad read in the name of your Lord read what your Lord had taught you read this book the Lord who taught you with the pen, the pen and the book, the basic fundamental of our religion is the pen and the book, education. Our religion is based on reading, on research, on contemplation. So that was the first event. The second important event in the history of Islam took place 13 years later and that was the Hijrah the immigration of the Prophet when he left his hometown Mecca because he had to leave God ordered him to leave his life was under threat of his own tribe of the people that he lived among them few of them tolerated him but the vast majority of them, because of their arrogance and conceit, they could not believe that he's the messenger of God. Because he posed a threat to their interest, to their worldly interest. So they could not accept him. They insisted on idol worshiping. They insisted on dividing the community and the society into two groups. The rich, the influential, the powerful, the abusers versus those who are deprived and hungry. So Muhammad came to change this formula. But those influential were unhappy with him. So they refused him. They rejected him. Only a handful of people accepted him for 13 years. God said to him, this environment would not work for you. You have to move. Go find another environment. And this is where he found the city of Medina. Received him with open arms. People accepted the message of God. And it was the second important hit, uh, event in the history of Islam, the Hijrah. The Hijrah, the immigration of the Prophet from the city of Mecca to the city of Medina. He lived there for 10 years and he died and he was buried in Medina. Now we come to the third event. And I welcome Tom, Tom Thurkelson, my friend from the Mormon church, a man of honor and dignity. He always stood Always, he has been standing as a loyal friend and defender of the Islamic faith in Orange County, in Southern California. Since I came to this land, I met him 
Always loyal. Good friend. Thank you for your surprise visit today. May Allah bless you. The third event in the history of Islam was the day of Ghadir. Equally important to the first two. The day of Ghadir. What is the day of Ghadir? The day of Ghadir, the Prophet worked very hard, 23 years, to teach, to educate, to transform barbaric people into civilized people. People who used to, uh, to kill their daughters alive. People of Arabia used to kill their daughters alive. They had no respect for females. Females were treated like cattle, animals, worse than animals. In a society where there was no security. When you go to your tent, to your house in the evening, you would not be assured that tomorrow morning you would be alive. Because your house, your tent, your neighborhood will be raided by your neighbors, not by foreigners, by your neighbors. In a society based on cowboy ethics, people would be killed for no reason. The land of Mecca was saturated with the blood, the blood of the brothers and the sisters from the same tribe, same people. They used to kill each other. One of these wars lasted for 100 years, 100 years between two main tribes. And the reason for that war, because they had horse racing, they had horse racing, and then they had a dispute between them. Which horse won the race? This dispute erupted in a war, in a war, fighting among two tribes, which lasted for 100 years. And Muhammad came to put an end to that war when he came as a messenger. Society based on arrogance, exploitation, racism, bigotry. The Prophet worked 23 years to transform them through his patience. He never lost patience. Through his endurance, hilm, God says to him, وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضَّنْ غَلِيبَ الْقَلْبِ لَنْ فَضُّ مِنْ حَوْلِكَ had you been hard-hearted, they would have left you. But because you were patient and tolerant, you did not leave your community. They treated him in a miserable way. They called him names. They threw stones at him. For 13 years, the Prophet, 13 full years, he leaves his house in the morning, he comes back home while he was bleeding by his own people. But he never lost faith in God. He never lost patience. So he built this community with patience, with tolerance. Now, does he leave this community? Does he leave this community without appointing a successor? The Sunnis, they say yes. The Prophet Muhammad left his community without leaving a successor. The Shia believe that the Prophet would never do that. He would never do that. No person today, no rabbi, no minister of religion, no priest, no imam, no sheikh would leave his community without appointing someone. Have you seen this mosque for 19 years? Would you come on a Friday and there is no Imam? Never ever for 19 years. Since September 20th, 1996, when we started this community, September 20th, 1996, until today. Whenever the Imam is absent, there is someone there. So am I smarter than Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? I am not. 90% of the Muslims, they think that the Prophet left his community without successor. 10%, the Shias, they say, no, 
God would not allow him to do that. He worked hard. He built strong community. How could he leave his community in disarray, in confusion? While he knows that some of his companions, they were vying for power and politics and influence and government and leadership. He would not do that. So on his first Hajj and last Hajj, the Prophet did Hajj only one time. Only one time. And he did the Hajj three months before his death. The Hajj is in the month of the Hijjah. And the Prophet died in the month of Safar. So the Hijjah, Muharram, Safar. Less than three months. God asked the Prophet to leave Medina, go to Mecca to perform the pilgrimage, Hajj. Muslims knew that their leader is going to go to Hajj. So they decided to go with him. People of Medina, people of Arabia, 5,000 people came from Yemen. Yemen, which is today under the bombardment of the Saudi regime. At that time, they converted to Islam. Yemenis were mostly Christians and Jews. Many of them converted to Islam. When they heard that the Prophet is coming to Hajj, they decided to leave their home and travel north and come to join the Prophet. The Prophet reached Mecca on the 5th of the Hijjah. On the 8th, he left Mecca to Mina. In Mina, there is a huge congregation. All the pilgrims, they gather in that desert of Mina, which witnessed 10 days ago a tragedy. Over a thousand people were killed in a stampede in Mina because of the mismanagement of the family of Al Saud. Family of Al Saud are not focusing on Hajj, focusing on their corruption, focusing on killing people of Yemen. So, this is what happened 10 days ago. Over a thousand people lost their life. However, the Prophet took that opportunity, the gathering of the Hujjaj, pilgrims in Mina, and he said to them, he gave a hint that soon I am going to leave my community for my final destination, going back to God. And there is an important thing I want to tell you. I want to appoint a successor so you don't have a dispute after me. You don't have a war after me. You don't kill each other after me. You unify the Ummah, the community around this successor. And that successor's name is Ali ibn Abi Talib So in Mina he declared that. Not only in Mina, God said to him, you need to remind them again. Again. So when the Prophet left Mecca after performing the Hajj, going to Medina, he said that I want all the people who performed the Hajj with me to come with me to the direction of Medina. Even those who are supposed to go south to Yemen, back home, they should come with me to the north, the direction of north. Because I have another statement to make. Even the Yemenis, you know Mecca is in the middle, Medina is in the north, Yemen is in the south. The Prophet said, the Yemenis also have to come with me towards Medina to listen to this declaration. So they joined him. A hundred thousand. hundred thousand at that time is a big number. hundred thousand Muslims, men and women, they joined him. When he reached an area, an oasis, Gabriel came from God, descended upon the Prophet. He said to him, now you have to make this declaration in the middle of this area. The weather was very hot, very hot, scorching sun. Gabriel said to the Prophet, here, before you reach Medina, God wants you to stop here and give them this declaration and appoint Imam Ali as a successor. The Prophet, the Quran says, Ya ayyuhar Rasul, Ballig ma unzila ilayka min rabbik. This is chapter 5, verse 67. Ballig ma unzila ilayka min rabbik. O Messenger of God, 
immediately deliver what God is asking you to deliver. And if you don't do, if you don't deliver, if you decline, as if you have done nothing for me, for God. Imagine the Prophet worked hard 23 years and God told him, listen, if you don't deliver this final message, as if you have done nothing for me. All your work is going to go in vain, going to be destroyed. Why God is talking to his beloved Muhammad with this harsh tone, threatening him? Why? Because the Prophet, he was reluctant to deliver this message. He knew that many of those Arabs would not accept it. Why? Because Ali, first of all, is his first cousin. Imam Ali is his first cousin. So they would blame the prophet of nepotism and favoritism. They would say he's bringing his cousin. Second of all, Ali was his friend, although the difference between them in age is 30 years, but Ali was the sweetheart of Muhammad. And the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam could not afford to be alone without Ali ibn Abi Talib. Whenever he misses him for a half a day, he will say, where is Ali today? Bring him to me. Ituni bi Ali. The Prophet, I can say this with full mouth, with full confidence. And there is a big witness there listening to me. The Prophet could not survive without the service and the defense of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Islam could not survive. Ali was the defense minister, protecting the Prophet, protecting religion, putting his life online, always the bravest among the Muslims. So the Prophet needed him, he needed his help. So, therefore, he gave him. The best gift, the Prophet had four daughters, but the last one, the youngest one, Fatima to Zahra, was the favorite. Not because the Prophet has a prejudice against others. No, no, no. Fatima was the favorite of God, not only Muhammad. <laughs> all Muslims agree, all Muslims in their books. God, there is nothing bigger than God in this universe. Nothing greater than God. Nothing greater than God in this universe. God says when Fatima becomes happy, I become happy. When she becomes sad, angry, I will become sad and angry for her sadness. This is Fatima. So the Prophet, all the Muslims, the companions, they came asking for his daughter's hand. Oh, Muhammad, give me your daughter Fatima. I want to marry her. One of them said, from Bani Umayyah, he said, I am I'm a filthy rich person. I'm a billionaire. Ask me for anything. I'll give gold, silver, land, property, camels, horses. The Prophet listened to him first. And then he took a bunch of pebbles. And then the Prophet is very polite, but he wanted to teach this man a lesson that my daughter is not for sale. I cannot exchange, don't think I'm exchanging my daughter for money. And he threw the pebbles into his face because that man was filthy and arrogant. He was intimidating, blackmailing the Prophet. Give me your daughter, I'll give you money. He thinks that the Prophet sells his daughter for, for money. And the Prophet decided to give his daughter to the poorest person in the community, to Ali ibn Abi Talib. Ali was 20, 24 years old. His job was farmer. He used to work for a Jewish farm owner in exchange, not for money, in exchange for some pieces of dates to eat them and survive on them. Do you imagine that? A farmer who works the whole day in the farm and then the landlord gives him dates, food, 
Although Ali is working with the palm trees, he can pick up any, any amount of dates, but he would not do that. Does not belong to him. At the end of the day, he would give him 10 pieces. Here you are. This is your wage. Ali had no single penny in his pocket. The Prophet gave him his daughter. When he came, the Prophet, he knew, he knew everything about Ali. The Prophet was the one who, who raised Ali. Ali was a baby. The Prophet took him from his father. He said to his father, give him to me. I will raise him. So he knew everything about Ali, but he wanted to ask him to make it public so people would know. He said to him, Ali, what gift you would offer my daughter Fatima, dowry, mahr? What marriage gift you would offer her? Ali said, my beloved prophet, you know everything about me. You know about my bank account. You know about my social security. Go and check it out. Check my balance. Ali said, I have three pieces that I own. Beside my clothing, humble clothing, I have three pieces. One thing, one piece is the sword. The second is the shield. You know, the fighter they use in one hand, sword, and the second, shield. The third is the water container that I carry it on my shoulder to water the trees. I have these three pieces, only, nothing else. This is my all assets. The Prophet said to him, Ya Ali, you need the sword. We need your sword. We can't afford that you lose your sword. If you lose your sword, we lose Islam, the entire religion. Islam is going to be defeated. So you need this weapon, the sword, to defend Islam. And you need the water container because you work with that. These are your tools. You need them. But Ali, I, you were my baby. I took care of you. I was the one who was raising you. I know you are a brave. You don't need a shield. You are a fighter who is in no need of shield. So sell your shield. Give it as a marriage gift to my daughter. He took his shield to the market. He sold it for 800, 480 dirham. 480 dirham. He brought the money to the Prophet. So the Prophet gave his daughter to, the, to Imam Ali, the poorest man in the community. The poorest materially. When it comes to money, he's the poorest but to the richest man in terms of ethics, in terms of faith, in terms of ethical standards and manners and akhlaq, Ali ibn Abi Talib, an outstanding youth in the community. So the Prophet had some fear that if I tell them that my successor is Ali, Ali is my first cousin, Ali is my baby, and Ali is my son-in-law, they immediately, they will blame me. Oh, look at Muhammad. He's doing favoritism today. God said to him, don't worry. I will defend you. Wallahu ya'asimuka minan nas. You deliver the message, I'll protect you. Because I want, I'm insisting that Ali should be your successor. Ali can unify the Muslims after him. So he declared that. 100,000 people came. The Prophet took the hand of Ali. He said, Man kuntu mawlah, Whosoever I am his leader and guardian and a prophet, fahada aliyun mawlah. After my death, Ali is going to be his leader and his guardian. And then the Prophet said, Allahumma wali man wala. O Lord, support whoever supports Ali. Wa man ada. And be the enemy of all those who become his enemy. One surman nasr. And give victory to those who give victory to Ali. Wahdul man khadala. And give defeat to those who defeat Ali or disappoint Ali. The prayers of the Prophet 1400 years ago. We see. 
materialization of this prayers today, those who stand with Ali are always victorious. Those who turn away from Ali, they are always defeated and always disgraced. And in the forefront of those who are disgraced because they turned their back to Ali and the Prophet and God are the Wahhabis, the Takfiris, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, those forces of evil who turned their back to God 1400 years ago. So this is the third important occasion in the history of Islam. First, the beginning of Islam, the beginning of the mission. Second, the Hijrah, the immigration of the Prophet from Mecca to Medina where he established the very first Islamic community based on justice and love and care. And third, the appointment, the declaration on the 18th of the Hijjah, the declaration of the successorship, the imama, the leadership, the guardianship of Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salatu was salam. Let me conclude. Some people ask, they say, well, what difference it makes whether Ali was the first successor to the Prophet or Abu Bakr or this or that, what difference it makes? What difference it makes? Don't you have this question in your mind? Hmm? Do you have this question in your mind or not? I'm sure you have it in your mind, but you don't share it with me. Sometimes you think, what difference it makes? Whether Ali became the first successor or Abu Bakr became. Now, 2015, what difference it makes? The Prophet answers this question on his deathbed. The Prophet on his deathbed, three days before his death, he died on Monday, Thursday before his death. He said, allow me to give you my will, my last will, my most important will to the Ummah. Bring me pen and paper so I write a will for you. لِأَكْتُبَ لَكُمْ كِتَابًا لَنْ تَظِلُّوا بَعْدِي أَبَدًا If you accept this will, you would never be disgraced, you would never be weak, you would never be disunited. You would never, oh Muslims, you would never go backward. You would have democracies in your countries. You know how many victims Every single day, the Mediterranean, how many victims claims every single day? People fleeing Syria, Iraq, Libya, Yemen, Egypt, North Africa. How many of them they drown in the Mediterranean every single day? Rather than taking shelter in Mecca and Medina, the holiest place in Islam, they take shelter in Germany in Britain. They travel from a Muslim country and take shelter in a non-Muslim country. Isn't this ironic? Hmm? A Muslim who's supposed to enjoy Islam in his community, he runs away to the non-Muslims. He seeks refuge and comfort and peace in a non-Muslim country. You know why? Because Muslim countries are just Muslim by name, not by character. Because we have dictatorship. Because in Muslim countries we have Islam, but we don't have Muslims. We only have the name. We carry the name. Have you seen some counterfeit products, t-shirt? Counterfeit. They put the designer name. But it is counterfeit, not real. This is our Islam. In these Muslim countries, Islam is a counterfeit version, not authentic. Had it been an authentic version, the Americans would come and seek shelter. The Europeans would come and seek shelter in Muslim countries, not vice versa. Because Islam is absent from our countries. 
And the very first country that Islam is absent from it is Saudi Arabia. It's Saudi Arabia. A country that is based on abuse of human rights and human dignity and the stampede in Mina is an example of that. This is one example. So the Prophet says, if you follow this, Kitab Allah, the book of God, if you follow this book and implement this book, which is very beautiful, this is the most tolerant book in this book. Tom, this book says, this book says that I have to respect you and love you and care for you and protect you in this book. Don't listen to ISIS, listen to this book. لا ينهاكم الله عن الذين لم يقاتلوكم في الدين ولم يخرجوكم من دياركم أن تبروهم وتقسطوا إليهم إن الله يحب المقسطين. God says in this book that I urge you, all Muslims, I urge you that when it comes to the people of book, the Jews and the Christians who did no harm to you, like you, your honor here, that you love them and care for them and defend them and be nice to them and kind to them. This is the book. This is the message of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is the message of Imam Ali. Imam Ali was the caliph for four years and nine months. They did not allow him to be the first. They pushed him back. When they had a failure for 25 years, we had three caliphs. They were a big failure. Then, when the first caliph, second caliph, third caliph, they died, they came begging Imam Ali, now we want you to be the caliph because you are the only one who can save Islam. Please, please Ali, accept leadership. He was reluctant. He said, leave me alone. I'm not about power. I'm not dying for power. Leave me alone. I'm doing my job here. They said, no, please. Islam is collapsing. You are the only one who can save Islam. He said, okay. He accepted. But even when he became caliph, they rejected him. Many people, they fought against him. So he ruled for four years and nine months. Ultimately, he was assassinated in the mosque. He was doing his prayers in the sanctuary. They killed him. When he was a ruler... One day, one of the people came from Basra. You know Basra in southern Iraq. In Basra, there were mixed community. There were Christians, Jews, and Muslims. The governor did something bad to one of the Christian citizens. So this Christian citizen, he traveled all the way from Basra to Kufa. Kufa was the capital, the seat of the Islamic capital where Ali had a small house, not in a palace, not in a mansion. Ali, he built this house with his hand. When he decided to move the capital from Medina to Kufa, there was already a palace there. They said to him, this is the seat of the governor. He said, no, 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 no. this is a wicked mansion. Keep me away from this. I don't want to see this mansion. This is not for me. I will build my own house. He built a small house. He himself, he built it with his children, with him, helping him. Very small house. The house still exists today. After 1,400 years, the house still exists. So, this Christian man came all the way traveling for one week from Basra, 500 kilometers, to Kufa. He stood before Ali. He said, Ali, I'm your subject. I'm a Christian. Your governor of Basra, he abused me. He wronged me. So I am seeking justice. Ali was so disturbed. He was so angry at the governor. So he wrote a letter to him. He said to him, listen, listen. I want you to discipline yourself. Otherwise, I'm going to remove you from this post. And let it be known to you. If a Christian, if anyone abuses a Christian under my leadership, my caliphate, as if he has, he has abused the caliph himself. 
So give him his right back to this man when he comes to you. Treat him well. Do justice to him. Christians enjoyed Ali's justice. Muslims enjoyed his justice. The Jews enjoyed his justice. You know, another Jewish man took him to court in Kufa. He took the leader to court. So they stood before the judge. A judge that was appointed by Imam Ali. So the judge, he wanted to be respectful to Imam Ali. He asked the Jew about his name, first name, last name. So the Jew said, this is my name. And then he turned to Imam Ali and he said to him, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, O oh, the commander of the faithful, the caliph, what would you say? What is your rebattle against this man? Imam Ali said to him, Stop, stop, stop. Don't call me Amir al Mu'mineen here, the caliph. Call me Ali ibn Abi Talib with my first name and last name. In the court, I'm a citizen. Now, I'm a citizen just like him. In the same way that you address the man with his first name and last name, you must do it with me. You would never discriminate in the court. I am a citizen here. Outside the court, yes, I'm a leader. You may call me Amir al-Mu'mineen. Inside the court, you call me by my first name and last name with no titles, no titles. This is the justice of Ali. Why people don't like Ali? Because he's a man of justice. He's a man of justice. Many people, they rejected him because he does not believe in corruption. He does not believe in a bribery. Now, we have a man sitting here by the name of Ali al Farooq. But this is his not real name. His real name is Umar al Farooq. When he picked me up at Denver airport, I never knew anything about him. He turned to me, he said, Sayyid, you know what is my real name? I said, isn't it Ali? He said, no, I'm Umar. I said, really? I wanted to escape, open the door and run away. <laughs> Immediately. He said, don't worry, you are safe. And he told me the story. Very capturing story, very moving story. In the shrine of Imam Hussein, 10 days ago, I mentioned his story in front of a huge congregation, and I saw the tears rolling down. This man, originally from the city of Mosul, which is now under the control of ISIS in northern Iraq. He was born in Baghdad to a very prominent family in Iraq, at Ta'i. At Ta'i comes from the tribe Qabila Tutay. Very prominent tribe. Originally they were Christians. Before Islam they were Christians. Then they converted to Islam. He, his family were always the supporters of the regimes in Iraq. His grandfather was a military pilot during the monarchy in Iraq. Tom, do you remember the monarchy in Iraq? which ended in 1958. I know you are young, but you still remember that. His grandfather was a pilot. His uncles were pilots working for the military in Iraq. But then, when he joined the seminary in Syria, he was listening to his professor one day, speaking about religions. So someone from Chechnya asks the, the professor that, what do you think of Shia? You mentioned all religions, all traditions, all schools, but you never mentioned about Shia. Immediately the professor becomes crazy. He becomes mad, he starts yelling. He says, no, 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 don't mention Shia. They are worse than Jews and the Christians. They are this and that, they are dangerous. Don't even mention them. So Omar was sit, sitting and listening. So he decided, he's a curious, he decides that let me go and find out of how bad the Shias are. So he goes and he travels to one of the neighborhoods, Sayyida Zayna, in Damascus. And there his journey to the truth begins. Of 
course, when he goes there, he was so frustrated and angry. And he went there to fight and to kill and to damage. Because there's a professor, there's a professor spoke very well about Shia. And he made all the students angry and frustrated. So he went there to take revenge from the Shia. But imagine, imagine, you go with one intention and you come back with another intention. Why? Because there is God there. And God says, I am behind the guidance. If I decide to guide, I will guide despite all circumstances. And then, after six months, but the journey begin with something very interesting. Very interesting. And this is why I want you to listen to this, because I want you to do the same. When you confront someone, okay, someone who's hard on you, don't be hard on him. Don't retaliate. Our Prophet says something very important. Our Prophet says, Treat people with your own manners, not with their manners. So if some people are low, don't treat them with the same level. Treat them with your level, which is high. Very beautiful. Treat people with your own ethics, with your own standards. Do not go down to their own standards. So he went there to the seminary, one of the seminaries that I happened to teach there and study there 30 years ago. But I'm still young, huh? <laughs> so he goes there full of anger, frustration, and he will mention the rest. Do you want me to mention the rest of it or you, you will say it? Let me say this part and then I will leave the podium for him. So he goes and he finds a Shia scholar there and immediately he opens his mouth with all these, the cliches of accusations against the Shias. The Shias have a different Quran. They fabricated another Quran. They don't believe in this same Quran. The Shias, they don't face Mecca in their, in their prayers. They face Najaf, the grave of Ali in there. This is exactly what his professor told him. The Shia do not believe in God and the Shia they have, if you, you know, examine them, they have a tail. Yeah, yeah, this is, I'm not, not, I'm not joking here, really. This is what they say about it. They, they have a tail and so on and so forth. So he goes with this mentality and when he starts attacking that man who's standing before him, after a few minutes the man tells him, Shaykh, take a seat. Please bring him a cup of tea. Bring him a cup of tea. Magical word. He tells me, he tells me that this was the beginning of accepting Shia Islam. Bring him a cup of tea. He said, I expected that he will attack back and he will call me names. At least he will kick me out of the building. He says, go, go away. He didn't do that. He embraced me. He said, take a seat, rest. You are tired, you are angry. Bring him a cup of tea. That is the beginning of the journey. We deserve to make a movie. The name of the movie, bring him a cup of tea. Yeah. Treat people well. You never know what happens after that. Control your anger. Be like the Prophet. Be like Ali ibn Abi Talib. Be like our Imams. We the Shias, we have to follow Muhammad and Ali, alayhim as -salam, in their ethics, in their manners, in the way they treated people.